thank you, Sarah. It's certainly an honor for me to be with you this morning as well uh, to introduce our, our guest speaker. Throughout history, the United Church of Christ Office of Communication, Inc. has always sat at the intersection of telecommunications, policy, and religion. And each year, we try to reflect that junction uh, of those worlds in a person we invite to deliver the annual Everett C. Parker T uh, Ethics in Telecommunications Lecture. This year's speaker, to our great delight, is well grounded in both of those worlds. Stephen Waldman has served as co-founder, CEO, and editor-in-chief of BeliefNet.com when he was drafted to author a major FCC report on the state of the media. In announcing Waldman's appointment, FCC Chairman Julius Janinkowski said he was, quote, uniquely qualified for that job because he was, quote, an award-winning journalist in the traditional media who became an internet pioneer, launching, launching running, and bringing to profitability one of the great content success stories. Earlier this year, the FCC issued Waldman's report entitled Information Needs of Communities, the Changing Media Landscape in a Broadband Age. NPR is on the media described it as one of the most comprehensive overviews of US media ever produced. The study assessed important policy and regulatory issues and made recommendations for government, the private sector, and not-for-profit media. But Steve Waldman is not your typical policy wonk. In 2000, Time Magazine identified him as one of its, uh, its 100 spiritual innovators of the new millennium. During this, his tenure, Belief, Belief Net won the General Excellence Award of the Online News Association and the National Magazine Award for General Excellence Online. His own journalism has appeared in media outlets ranging across the spectrum from Huffington Post to National Review Online and from the Washington Post to ChristianityToday.com. He also wrote the New York Times best-selling book, Founding Faith, Providence, Politics, and the Birth of Religious Freedom in America, a book that I would commend to all of you and certainly for religious leadership uh, it is an asset in advancing the, con the, the conversation in this nation around the relationship between church and state. Here to deliver the 29th Annual Everett C. Parker Ethics and Telecommunications Lecture, please join me in welcoming Steve Waldman. Thank you so much. Uh, this really is a tremendous honor for me. Thank you, Reverend Black. Um, it's a great honor to be here with you, Reverend Parker, and the other uh, honorees, in um, particular, Commissioner Copps. I've gotten to know uh, Commissioner Copps a little bit during my time at the FCC and came to see what many of you have known for many years before me, that few people in American life are as committed as he is and has been to ensuring that the media systems work on behalf of all Americans. Uh, I have been really looking forward to, to this talk because it's probably the first time, maybe the only time, that I can talk to an audience that's equally obsessed with my two great interests, uh, religion and the news media, which uh, by most of my friends were thought to be completely unrelated. Um, and yet, there are a surprising number of similarities that I want to talk about. For one thing, uh, both religion and news media have at times wondered how they could keep from being overrun by technology. Uh, in the early days of BeliefNet, I used to talk to clergy all the time who were very worried about how the internet was going to destroy or undercut organized religion. Won't people just cobble together their own hollow, easy-to-bake, religion instead of going to church or going to uh, houses of worship? Won't they stop coming through our doors? And I used to point out at that time 
that in the early days of the internet, everyone thought that from here on, all toys are going to be bought by, on eToys.com. You may not know that website anymore because it went out of business, as I would uh, point out. And I said, now actually most toys online are bought by, on the website of ToysRUs.com. Toys R Us is what in, the, in this world the lingo was known as a bricks and mortar operation. It's not to say the bricks and mortar operations always win, but they do start with some advantages. I remember telling a, a group of Catholic priests, you know, most startup ventures uh, can get venture capital funding if they prove that their business model has worked for a few months. And you guys have a business model that's worked for a few millennia. Uh, work with that. You've got a pretty strong brand. A lot of distribution outlets, good theme songs. Uh, you have a lot going for you. And, and yes, you'll have to change, but if you embrace technology, use it as an exciting way to get your message out, rather than sticking your head in the sand and hoping it goes away, you will thrive. And that would turn out to have been very good advice for the newspaper industry uh, and for TV managers as well. Embrace the technology, use it, uh, and you may be able to uh, use the technology to help advance your mission rather than allowing it to destroy you. Another similarity between religion and journalism, both care in some sense about the good news. Uh, when religious folks, of course, talk about the good news, they mean Christ's message of redemption. When journalists talk about good news, they mean maybe news that's well done, that informs, educates, holds public officials accountable, it seems different. But there are more similarities, I think, than might be first apparent. And I don't mean only that both newspapers and the Holy Scriptures tell stories about murders, floods, health tips, and religious wars. Uh, rather, they both attempt to get some, at something they call the truth. They do so, of course, in profoundly different ways. The world's Great religious faiths try to explain big truths, why we're here on this earth, how we are fundamentally connected to each other. Journalism attempts to describe what has happened and why. And they obviously they view evidence differently, use evidence differently. But they both attempt to get at the question, why is the world this way? Uh, now, I don't mean to romanticize either profession. Obviously, both religion and journalism uh, practitioners have too often been corrupted. Some religious and journalistic leaders, uh, practitioners, have abused their roles uh, by being spiritually or intellectually dishonest or abusing their tremendous power to pit human beings against each other and to spread misunderstanding and, and ignorance. In both professions, the corrupt ones have abused a sacred public trust. But the best among journalistic and religious practitioners take their callings very seriously. And now I'm going to make a confession. Um, so I hope the folks on the, uh, on the, uh, in New York are listening carefully and with some generosity. Um, in the course of my 10 years leading BeliefNet, I was interviewed hundreds of times on TV and radio and elsewhere, and thankfully I was never asked the one question I dreaded, which was, do you believe in God, uh, and if so, why? And I dreaded this question not because I didn't believe in God, I do, but because my personal path to belief was so weirdly idiosyncratic that I thought it would puzzle or alienate many of our readers. So I was happy for it to not come up. Uh, because it wouldn't be about uh, any particularly classic divine experience. Uh, he never spoke to me in a burning shrubbery in Prospect Park. Um, I believed because of what would sometimes happen when I sat down to write. <clears throat> Oftentimes there's a point in the writing process, in the journalistic process, when the shortcuts beckon. If I phrase the sentence this way, it might be a little bit less accurate, but much more interesting. And who would know? 
If I turn the characters in this drama into caricatures, sure, it would lose some nuance, but it would be much more readable. And who would know? And then it occurred to me, I actually came to believe in there being a truth in the matter. I believed that if I didn't make an intellectually honest attempt to capture what actually happened, he would know. Somewhat to my surprise, I realized, I believed that there was such a thing as truth and in the need to reveal it. I confess this with some trepidation because my confession will strike most journalists as unjournalistic, unempirical, and unbecoming. A journalist friend of mine a number of years ago said, you know, journalism is not one of the healing professions. <laughs> uh, and in some sense, he's right. Uh, to be a good journalist, you must be unsentimental and relentless and sometimes harsh. Uh, usually, you really cannot get caught up in wondering uh, what uh, might hurt someone's feelings. But, but I, I disagree in another sense. The best journalists that I have known and worked with actually have a very strong moral and spiritual core. When confronted with the extreme difficulty of unraveling what happened, the best journalists do not merely throw up their hands and declare, it's hard to say, so I won't try. I'll rely on lazy, he said, she said reporting. I'll be a stenographer instead of a reporter. I'll rely on press releases and spin instead of hard work of digging. And the good ones instead proclaim, it's hard to say, so I'll try harder. When in the privacy of their cubicle, they realize they could subtly present information in a different way, even to make the bad guy look a little worse, which is very tempting sometimes. A still small voice tells them to stop, not because they'll get caught, but because a more theological idea has snuck into their cynical brains that there is such a thing as truth, and it is my professional obligation to seek it. That is why the best journalists that I have known in my life often have been among the most morally grounded people I have known. I have to say, when the FCC chairman asked me to look at the state of the American news media, he did not suggest that I do this uh, to explore whether God was pleased with the state of the news media, <laughs> although that might have meant we'd get less Republican criticism if he had. Uh, rather, his mission was more Madisonian, uh, to find out whether the modern media system was working for democracy. He asked me almost two years ago to assess the changing media landscape and report on whether communities were getting the information and the news that they needed and deserved. So my, uh, we, we did a 360-something page report, uh, which you can find at FCC.gov slash info needs report. But my tweet length summary is this. There is tremendous innovation in the modern media landscape, but there are also some very worrisome consequential gaps. Let's start with the bad news. Staffing in America's newspaper newsrooms has dropped by more than 25% in the last few years, with many newspapers losing as much as half of their staffs, some newspapers shutting down entirely. Newspaper staffing now is at a level, is at the same level, about the same level, maybe a little less, as it was before Watergate. You can see this rippling through cities and in different beats. In Baltimore, they did a study showing that the newspapers there produced 32% fewer stories in 2009 than in 1999. Another study looked at Philadelphia as a case study and concluded in just a three-year period from 2006 to 2009, available, quote, available news about public affairs issues has dramatically diminished by many measures, news hole, airtime, keyword measurements. Uh, a study of the Raleigh-Durham market, as an example, said that the News Observer there, a, a formerly fine newspaper, uh, in 2004 had 250, 250 newsroom employees. Uh, by February of this year, it was down to 103. Now, the really significant thing there is to look at the beats that were eliminated. Courts, schools, legal affairs, agriculture, environment, state education. These cuts have rippled through in very frightening ways. State house coverage. From 2003 to 2008, while state spending on state uh, grew by about 20%, the numbers of reporters covering the state legislatures dropped by one-third. 
That's a pretty disturbing formula for anyone who's interested in safeguarding public dollars. Investigative news, and this is a little bit uh, of a squishy term to define, so we looked for indirect clues, but here are a few. The Investigative Reporters and Editors Association, the membership of IRE in 2003 was 5,400 people. Now it is 4,000 people. 